Unlock the power of your mind. This is Provocative Enlightenment with Eldon Taylor. Welcome to another hour dedicated to inquiry, reflection, questions, possibilities, philosophical quandaries, uncovering dissonance, and a whole lot more, all in our effort to understand exactly what enlightenment means and what it is to be enlightened. Indeed, an hour dedicated to learning something more about ourselves, an hour designed to help us go further inward and perhaps challenge some of those old ideas about the world we live in and the people we have become. This is an hour where we strive to evaluate knowledge as inseparable from the total experience of reality. I'm Eldon Taylor, and this is Provocative Enlightenment. All right, each week I read a few of your letters as our way of paying respect to the importance you play in helping us to shape our show and improve it in every way. Three weeks ago, our show was about my book, What Does That Mean? Exploring My Meaning and Mysteries. Patty wrote, and I wanted to get this on the air earlier, but we just had too many letters. So are you ready for this one, Ravinder? This is our fan, Patty. I love Patty. This is a deep subject, she, she writes. Exactly what your book did and not what it said. Don't know whether to curse you or kiss you. Thanks for the journey through my childhood, for the good times and the bad, or should I say the unexplained. I thought I had put them all to bed with a reasonable explanation or a satisfactory dismissing, tucked away in a drawer. I guess I thought it was crazy or some of it just didn't happen. I made it through to 56 years and married to the same person for 33 plus years, raised three wonderful kids. So I guess these things never really happened, or did they? Then you go and open that drawer with all your similar (laughs) stories. I seriously revered you, this well-known and respected writer, scientist, criminalist, (laughs) etc., but now you are just like me. I have listened to the last two shows on rebroadcast. And I'm starting to see through you, E.T. You are not this stone-faced, unfeeling, cold-hearted interviewer. (laughs) Nope. The grizzly has melded into the fabric softener, cuddly teddy bear just grilling his guests to find the answers to what the hell does that mean? Sorry to paraphrase your title. And now your new book, What If? Ugh, I am still reading. Maybe it is good it doesn't come out until late March. It will give me time to stop spinning. Seriously, though, Eldon, I am seeing the world through different rose-colored glasses. It is much nicer color. Spreading love wherever I can. Thank you. Hubby home today and hoping to listen to your show. You don't. Uh, you have Mr. Don't Believe This Stuff, doubting and discussing his own what-does-that-mean stories. You are really scaring me. Knew this would be long, edited it a hundred times. Sorry, it may sound disjointed. It's the reeling effect. Thanks again for sharing the book with me. Much love to you and Ravinder. Now, that's the letter, Rev. What do you what do you think about that one? Well, I've known for quite a while that you're just a jelly bear. <laughs> you know, we love you. Yeah, no. I think it's cool, but it does, you know, put together what your work is all about. And the fact is we, we are all on the path together. We learn from each other, and it's all part of the process. I love it. Fact, fact. Okay, last week our show was all about astral projection or out-of-body experiences. Our guest Robert Bruce informed us that just as there were angels, there were demons, and that certain steps should be taken to avoid psychic attacks. He further informed us that animal astral that animals astral project. Indeed, according to him, everything projects during sleep. He also informed us that entities were earthbound and cannot cross running water, so he encouraged showering. All right, John wrote, I don't know that I believe everything Mr. Bruce had to say, but he certainly is someone that I'd like to see you bring back to the show for another hour of discussion. Okay, John, Robert has already indicated a desire to come back, so we'll see if we can set something up. Leslie wrote, fascinating show. Want to hear more and give it a try? Loretta wrote, I love listening to your show and hope to help myself change. Two weeks ago, our show was about self-sabotage, and we discussed the InterTalk technology. Angie wrote, thanks to your CD, my sister is a changed woman. I want to be positive like her, too, now. And finally, Jeff wrote, and this is a long one, but it's worth sharing. Quote, in the past, I've written some pretty heated responses to your show and your style of interviewing. 
After a while, I stopped writing for the simple reason I felt you weren't listening, just defending. That being said, I have still listened to every single episode you put up, and I have gone and listened to your other shows online. For the most part, I think you are an amazing asset to Hay House and to the world of alternative thought and philosophy. I think where my problem, and from my listening to letters over the past year, I think some people have of a struggle, is not that you challenge your guests, not that you demand a rigorous standard of science. I want more of that, more challenges, more discussions, more attempts to reach the truth, but that you do it unequally. You never challenge Lorna or Jay-Z. You say you have the proof and that is enough for you. But if someone said that to you, you would demand to know the proof and say that it wasn't valid without disclosure. But you have never offered disclosure. You support a woman who channels an entity who admits to extreme acts of violence, and yet you refute Walsh for saying there are no absolute virtues. It is not that you challenge, it's that you only challenge certain guests and blindly accept others, which as a journalist I am sensitive to, and this calls into question your veracity and your willingness to truly look at all your guests and to interview them on equal standing. This is my biggest concern. I think you have a very strong bias, and that is fine, but it is not fine to say you are searching for the truth when you only search for it in some cases and expect us to blindly accept that Lorna talks to angels and demons and Jay-Z channels. It isn't important to me whether they do or they don't, but what is important is that you challenge and provoke all your guests, not for the sake, not for your sake, but for ours. So we can know the truth and see it from all sides. Again, you are amazing. I stand behind your show. I think what you are doing is great, and I think it must be hard to do a show like yours at Hay House. But I am glad you are on the air. I am glad you exist, and you add a great deal to my inner discussion. I just wish you would be more willing to challenge those you agree with so that you find a way to accept them, so that we can find a way to accept them as eagerly as you do. Thanks again for such a wonderful show. Close quote. All right. Well, thanks, Jeff, for the letter and for the subsequent letters that you and I have uh, have exchanged. And for all of you out there, uh, Jay-Z Night Channels, and that I I take no issue with because uh, hard scientists have gone in and they have actually measured... uh, changes in electromagnetic field, and another other, a, a number of other anomalies. And when I interviewed Jay-Z, I made sure that that all was brought out. So <clears throat> the fact that something is going on there beyond the scope of what we can say we understand within the limits of uh, our, our so-called reductionistic materialistic laws, well, that's just a fact. Beyond that point, I don't necessarily support anything. Uh, where uh, Lorna is concerned, you know, Jeff is absolutely right. I have my own personal experiences with Lorna telling me things the angels have said that I didn't. I mean, there's just no way or it was beyond mathematical probability that by coincidence she would have tagged into those things. Uh, But you know what? I answered Jeff and I told him that I heard him. His point regarding a fairness doctrine, I'll put that in quotation marks, is well made. I can be biased, and I know that, and I recognize that, you know, hey, I do give some people uh, or have up until now a free ride. I do have some very strong personal beliefs, and they do come through from time to time. That is not likely to change, but I will begin to question more thoroughly those that I am familiar with, for as Jeff said, It's for the benefit of all of us, you out there as well as myself. That said, I do not see myself as a reporter of the news or some other form of objective journalist, as Jeff might have implied there. Uh, I am a commentator and, and an author, and as such, I will step up with my opinions on matters such as with Neil Donald Walsh. That is a part of my motive for doing this show. I write books, host a radio show, conduct seminars, and the like to share my views and to learn from others. I believe there is a side of the equation that is simply not shared often enough, and I seem to be on that side. Given that, it's clear that I will not please everyone. But again, thanks, Jeff, for the letter, and it has been taken to heart, 
uh, we, you know, do stay tuned. We have Lorna coming to the show, uh, I believe, in April. And, and you see if I don't give her a, a, a more fair interview, according to that perspective. All right, it's all the time we're going to take for letters today. But I do invite you to opine by sending your email to Eldon at EldonTaylor.com or by joining me on Facebook. You can also just leave comments on my website. I do try to read all of your letters, and they do impact our programming. I highly value your input, so once again, thank you, all of you, for your feedback and comments. Now to today's show. Who and what you see before you die. We have hosted guests that have spoken about near-death experiences, shared death experiences, the channeled words of the risen, hospice care, and the letting go process, family and friends, and what they see as a person passes. But today, we're going to take a look at what the dying person themselves experiences. Our guest is eminently well qualified for this conversation, missing only one credential, fortunately, and that's that he's not returned from the dead or dead. Some argue that these death experiences, if you will, are all just a matter of the brain winding down, and therefore it's just a natural biological matter, nothing metaphysical at all. Indeed, scheduled this month for our show is neurologist Dr. Kevin Nelson, who says his book is the first comprehensive, empirically tested, and peer-reviewed explanation of the biology behind near-death experiences. Using brain scans, he's mapped the borderlands of consciousness, concluding that spirituality is a part of our biology. So today we have point, and in a couple of weeks we will have the counterpoint. Okay, in his book, Vision, Trips, and Crowded Rooms, get that title, you want to read this book, it is a great read, Vision, tri- Visions, Trips, and Crowded Rooms. Author David Kessler addresses five common deathbed experiences. In his words, quote, Throughout my years working with the dying, I have noticed commonly shared experiences that remain beyond our ability to explain and fully understand. In the tapestry of life and death, we may begin to see connections to the past that we missed in life. While death may look like a loss to the living, the last hours of a dying person may be filled not with emptiness, but rather with fullness, close quote. David Kessler is one of the most well-known and respected experts and lectures on grief and loss. He co-authored two bestsellers with a legendary Elizabeth Kubler-Ross on grief and grieving and life lessons. David states that he was honored to have uh, been at Elizabeth's bedside during her passing. His first book, The Needs of the Dying, a number one best-selling hospice book, received praise from none other than Mother Teresa herself. His services have been used by the likes of Elizabeth Taylor, Jamie Lee Curtis, and Mary Ann Williamson when their loved ones faced life-challenging illnesses. He also worked with the late actors Anthony Perkins and Michael Landon. David's work has been featured on CNN, NBC, PBS, and Entertainment Tonight, and he has been interviewed on Oprah and Friends. He has been discussed in the New York Times has written for the Boston Globe, the Los Angeles Times, the San Francisco Chronicle, the Wall Street Journal, and Anderson Cooper 360, where you can see why I say he is eminently well qualified. Welcome to Provocative Enlightenment, Mr. David Kessler. Thank you. So good to be with you today. Oh, it's indeed our pleasure. We're honored to have you join us. How about beginning by telling us a little bit about why you became interested in hospice care, when and where, and and your first work, beginning with uh, Elizabeth Kubler-Ross. Sure. I think I began, uh, you know, all of us sometimes begin in our work personally before we begin professionally. And and I was one of those kids growing up that was practically raised in hospitals because I had a mother who only had one kidney when I was born. So she was always being admitted and discharged, and so I was always hanging out at vending machines and new hospitals, you know, forward and backward. And when she passed away, I was 12 years old. She was in a hospital where the visiting age was 14. So she died alone in an intensive care unit without us being able to see her or her family around. And at that young age, I knew as as tough as that 
uh, as tough as death can be in losing a loved one, we have to have a better experience of it here. So I think that was really my motivation to sort of end up growing up and be someone who realizes, you know, you can't take away that pain uh, of loss from people, but I'd like to make it a little more meaningful and, you know, help people. So I think that is where I personally came from in doing this work all these years. You know, I think, and I'm sure somebody's probably told you this already, your mother gave you a great gift because what you share with the world is indeed a continuation of that gift, my friend. The title of your book is a lot to say, in my opinion, Crowded Rooms. What, what does that mean? Well, it's very interesting. And just swinging back to Kubler-Ross, when I started working with Kubler-Ross, Kubler-Ross used to tell me about people having deathbed visions. And, you know, I was still on the younger side and trying to build credibility and wanted to be taken seriously. And here I was with, you know, the Elizabeth Kubler-Ross. She would tell me how people, and I was like, oh, I don't even want to know about that. And it was interesting kind of as I've matured, uh, I would see uh, more and more healthcare professionals, more and more families saying that their loved ones would begin as they were dying, the last few weeks of dying, even the last few days and hours, would begin to be greeted by the dead, that that veil between life and death would seem to drop and their loved ones who were dying all of a sudden would have a vision of their person who had predeceased them coming. They also would start talking about going on trips and journeys. And the original word for hospice means your final resting place before you take your long journey. And they would also talk about there's crowds of people in their room, and they wondered who these were. And it was interesting as I started uh, becoming uh, more and more sort of on the circuit for the different conferences, I would go to all these national sort of end of life and hospice conferences. And I always found it interesting, you know, being with people from Harvard and Yale and places like that who were, you know, very serious about the topic, we'd all go to dinner. And after a few drinks and everyone, what everyone really wanted to talk about was how their patients were having deathbed visions. And I eventually thought, I, I finally feel like I'm mature enough and have the courage to write about this. Well, your book is a wonderful book. You heard me say that in the intro. Uh, share, you know, uh, one or two of these kinds of experiences that uh, patients tell you about. Can you do that? Sure, absolutely. Well, it's interesting. What we see is we see that patients, as they are um, going into their final days and hours, uh, we'll often have a visitation from the dead. It is the number one person who usually comes is our mother. No surprise there. That the woman who was there in those moments we took our first breath would once again be there as we took our last breath. We uh, will reach our hands upward as we go into those last weeks, days, and hours. Uh, people see this vision usually in the corner of the room. They will also see angels. So these are a number of phenomenons, and I also felt, as I would talk to family members, they would say to me, it's so sad. Our grandpa was such a smart man, but you know, he went crazy at the end of his life. He thought he was seeing the dead. And that's another reason why I felt like we really owe it to people to start the conversation about what really happens at the end of life, so that people think when, and know when their loved ones begin to see the dying appear, the dying begin to see the dead appear, that your grandfather isn't going crazy. He's experiencing something quite normal. And every lecture that I do, I ask health care professionals to raise their hand if they've had a patient who's had a deathbed experience. Ninety percent of every lecture, and sometimes I'm even at other people's lectures and I ask the question, it's remarkable how common this is and yet not talked about. You know, and in reading your book, there's a story that you tell of a, of a psychologist, I believe, whose father is uh, greeting his wife, who has been long dead. And she, the psychologist doesn't suspect that he is actually that close to dying, but then he goes in his sleep after what she thought was just uh, maybe a hallucination. Is, is that fairly common? Things like that happen all the time, and, and I very much um, wanted to question this and look into it and try to explain this, and it was interesting that uh, Oprah.com asked me to write an article about this, and CNN asked me to write an article, 
And they had over a thousand pages of responses from people of stories of loved ones doing this and having this experience. And, you know, it's interesting from the critics, you know, they will kind of say, uh, well, you know, why did you choose to write about this? How do we know it's true? And uh, my response is, look, if people who were dying started seeing pink rabbits, I'd be questioning why is everyone seeing pink rabbits? The reality, whether we like it or not, is the dying do see the dead, and I want to report on that. And it's interesting in the book, I have interviews, I made sure it was strictly health care providers, doctors, nurses, clergy, priests, rabbis, social workers, psychiatrists, to really give their health care opinion on what they've been seeing in the last weeks and days of life. Yeah, who better? I mean, who better to attend to that? But let me ask you this. I have heard stories that... Uh, there, in, in these last moments, uh, particularly with young people, they will meet a relative that has passed, that passed so far before uh, their lifetime that they, they're totally un, even unfamiliar with them. But they'll, they'll tell you things about them. Have you encountered that? Yes, that was one of the real surprises. There were interviews of people who... They were greeted, you know, by this gentleman who said he was there to take care of them, and let's say his name was Brian. And and everyone was like, who's Brian that, you know, they're talking to? And, you know, everyone was wondering, who's Brian? What's a Brian and all that? And the person would pass, and Brian would seem to have been there. And then all of a sudden, the mother comes out and says, oh, well, I never told anyone, but, you know, you know, he was adopted or whatever, and his biological father was Brian. So there's times people meet people, they don't even know who they are, that, and that they come a, for us. That makes a pretty good case for evidence, doesn't it, for the so-called Doubting Thomas? Absolutely, and it's fascinating to me. I looked into so many areas about this. Uh, you know, I was concerned about, I want to know why it's not oxygen deprivation. Then we would get stories from people who were three weeks out from death, who didn't have any oxygen issues at that point, who were oxygenating well. There was no way to explain them. We hear that it's a side effect of the drugs, the morphine, et cetera. We have people who weren't on any pain medication, that weren't on medications at all, and have them. We hear it's the mind deteriorating. When I looked into that, you think about there are millions, if not billions, of ways for us to live and to die. Everyone dies so uniquely. Why would everyone have the same vision? Because the brain can disintegrate in a million different ways. How in everyone who has these visions could it disintegrate in exactly the same way, causing the exact same vision? You know, when we come back, we've got a hard break coming up, but when we come back, I want to make sure that we we pick up and take on some of these uh, uh, consistent uh, aspects, uh, because that that does become a part of the proof. You're uh, you're tuned to and listening to Provocative Enlightenment Radio. My guest today is David Kessler, and we're discussing his wonderful book, Visions, Trips, and Crowded Rooms. Uh, who and what you see before you die. We have uh, links uh, at uh, eldentaylor.com that lead to David Kessler's site, to his books, uh, and and this is a book that. I strongly recommend it. I can't tell you more than that. It's just a great read. We'll be right back after these works from some of our friends. Be sure to stay tuned. Do you feel like you've become lost in a funhouse? Only seeing the reflection of yourself past, future, and present, but unable to find the real you, I invite you to step through the doorway and onto the path leading to understanding of your mind, your choices, and the influences that surround you. Read Elton Taylor's New York Times best-selling book, Choices and Illusions. Now expanded, updated, and revised, it will provide you with real-life examples of how you can break free from your current perceptions and begin your journey to how high is up. Get your copy today from all bookstores or online from Amazon.com or Barnes & Noble. Close your eyes. 
Imagine your goals and dreams. What's preventing you from accomplishing them? Most often, we are our own worst enemies. I can't. I'm not good enough. It's time to reprogram that inner dialogue. Replace all those negative self images with I'm good. I am powerful. I can do anything. Eldon Taylor's Inner Talk patented subliminal technology does just that. Researched at numerous universities such as Stanford and by governments such as Mexico and Germany, Inner Talk has repeatedly been proven effective at changing your self talk. Stop imagining your goals and make them a reality today. Visit www.innertalk.com. That's I N N E R T A L K.com. Innertalk.com. Unlock the power of your mind. This is Provocative Enlightenment with Eldon Taylor. Welcome back. If you just joined us, we're discussing with David Kessler his book, Vision, Strips and Crowded Rooms, Who and What You See Before You Die. But before we get back to today's show, I want to invite you to check out our new Provocative Enlightenment website. Just go to ProvocativeEnlightenment.com. Also, how about liking our Facebook fan page for Provocative Enlightenment Radio? As a fan of the show, you'll receive special announcements and incentives from time to time as our way of thanking you for your support. I would also like to invite you to join me on Facebook while you're there, and of course, you can follow me on Twitter. Let's get back to the show. Before the break, we were discussing the consistency or the similarity between uh, the experiences that the dying have. And, uh, David, that, that gives rise to a question. You know, uh, when, when you think about what the hereafter looks like, uh, there's a lot of culturally relative information out there. I mean, Buddhists seem to see something, Christians see something else. But when it comes to this dying process, is it always, is it that similar? It's very, very similar. And it's interesting. That's the one thing that I, I sort of will get a bit criticized in letters about, and people will say, Gosh, you know, it just seems like you, you kind of made your stories all alike. And, and I respond with, no, believe me, as an author, if I was writing this and I could just make up stories, I would have made them all different for interest. <laughs> but the reality is, that is what we see, and people see it in so many different cultures. For folks that may be interesting who uh, had a chance to see when the movie was out in theaters, uh, hereafter, Clint Eastwood's new movie with Matt Damon, and I know it's coming out on DVD soon, um, I worked on part of that movie, and it's interesting that my counterpart in the movie says the exact same thing, that, you know, she talks about the stories from the dying are just remarkably similar, that there's no other way to explain the similarity across cultures. Yeah, I and that to me becomes evidential. We have we have lots of comments and questions coming out of our chat room and the lines are all lighting up with people that have questions for you. You up to taking some calls? Absolutely. All right. Well, let's go to line 1 where we have Janice who is very patiently waiting to uh, address us from Louisiana. Welcome to Provocative Enlightenment, Janice. Hi. How are you? Thank you for taking my call. Indeed, I, our pleasure. Thank you so much. Uh, I'm so sorry I had not heard about um, your guest until today, but I wanted to call to say that I do believe what he's saying is true. My mother, uh, when she passed away, she passed away in 2000, and prior to her passing, several days before, she started getting dreams, having dreams about her minister, and she was saying uh, as well that, uh, that she. He was telling her not to be afraid to come, you know, to because he had passed away several years before she had passed. And then last month in February, I have an aunt who was 95 years old, and she passed. And she was very alert and aware until up until maybe uh, a few weeks before she, well, maybe I'd say a week before she passed. And um, a few days before she passed, she kept uh, saying her brother's, her deceased brother's name, that she was seeing him in the room. She was, you know, in the hospital room. And so I do believe what your guest is saying, that uh, someone comes. But I wonder if 
uh, there are others, there are angels or Jesus or something that comes as well to meet uh, the dying? People do remark, and thanks for your, your comments, Janice. Uh, people do remark about angels coming to visit them. Uh, it will usually be the dying, uh, usually a relative they know, but sometimes not a relative that they know. They may not even know the person. And one of the things that I just love about you calling in and sharing your story is I'm sure so many listeners are going, well, he's not telling us anything new that we haven't experienced in our own family over the years. But I think what I felt the need to do is really, from a medical perspective, to write all this information down, to let other medical people and people who haven't been with the dying to know this is real. Yes. So just like you, when your loved one has these, you won't go, oh, my gosh, I, I hope people don't think we're crazy that this happened, but to know, no, this is common. Right. And some people believe very profound and holy. And, and that all, to me it means something more as well that we are not um, just bodies, that we, when we do pass, we are not uh, put in the ground. It's just a physical aspect of what's Evidence going into for the afterlife. ground. And yeah. uh, it, it, it makes you know that there is something more to life. Excellent. Than, Thanks. Yes. Thanks Thank for calling. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, appreciate Okay. I'm got, what I'm going to try and do is I'm going to jump back and forth between the chat room and the phone lines. And so in, in our chat room, we have a, a prominent uh, physician, uh, a former guest on our show, a good friend of mine, uh, and he has a question for you. It is, could it be that life as we know it is but a dream and that death, natural uh, due to disease, uh, is one way of waking up? Accident, suicide is merely a shortcut. And or this one, do the dying activate brain areas that allow dimensions not normally seen, but just a heartbeat away to be perceived? This is uh, heavenly light sounds, deceased loved ones, etc. And then he goes on, uh, MRI near death show an interesting activation of brain areas not thought to be able uh, to function at the last moments. Now, this is a neurosurgeon, Dr. John L. Turner from Hilo, Hawaii, who submits these questions to you. How do you want to handle that? Well, I think they're very good, good questions. And, you know, I, one of the dilemmas in this area is that it is so difficult to study because, let's face it, people who are surrounding their loved ones at the end of life don't really want them put in an MRI machine. So it is hard to get, you know, accurate data. And I don't know that we're ever going to find proof for this. I actually think that some things are by design to not be able to give us proof. And, you know, people feel like, well, that is maybe a way to get off the hook. But I think if someone came forth with a way to study this, it'd be remarkable. That hasn't happened yet. I certainly say, just like you introduced me, you say the one thing I haven't done is I haven't died. So there are many questions that I can't answer about this phenomenon. And my job is to just, you know, be a reporter from the lines of end of life and say this is what happens. And I think it's good that we're open and looking into it and beginning these conversations. I think there is great value in something you implied, and that, that is this nature of faith. Uh, and anyone that has ever read uh, the existentialist Soren Kierkegaard realizes that uh, without that, the mystery of life disappears. And with that, so does much of its value. Let's uh, jump over to the telephones and take Madeline in Chicago, Illinois. Madeline, welcome to Hi. Provocative Enlightenment. Hi. Hi. Thanks for taking my call. Oh, I'm going to be in Chicago soon. Yay. Where? When? Uh, I think we're in negotiation for a Unity Church there, and I'm also going to be at Ions. Oh, excellent. Is it going to be on your website? It I'm will hoping? be. Give it a few days, and it should be up on okay, grief.com. While we're on that subject, excuse me, Madeline, give your website uh, to everyone out there, would you, David? Sure, it's grief.com. You know, people are always surprised. They go, not like grief, grief, like as in grief. And I'm like, yeah, there's actually a person behind grief.com. So <laughs> you can find me always at grief.com. All right, Madeline, your question or comments? Okay, my, well, it's a question and a comment. No one's ever come back to talk about it that I know of. But what is your feeling, uh, David, on... Once they pass, are they aware of us who are left behind? What is your feeling on that? That's an excellent question. 
My sense is, and it's nothing more than a sense, that they are. I mean, there's just a lot of interactions and things that sort of happen that, um, uh, you know, I, I just believe they are. You know, I think many of us have anecdotal stories that we, we feel like the dying in some ways still do watch over us and care for us. And once again, I, I don't know how we would prove it, but many of us have a story of just feeling it in an interaction or something that happened. Okay. Thank you. Sure. It feels good. Thanks and for I calling, think, you Maddie. know, we also apply our, you know, our, our, our small mind thinking to this and think, well, how could that be and how could they do this and be that and reincarnation and try to put it all together? But, you know, I, I believe that there are expansions beyond our knowledge, that we don't necessarily have to know how everything works for it to work. Mm-hmm. All right. Thanks for calling, Madeline. Thanks. Let's jump back over to the chat room now. And David, uh, Katie in the chat room says that uh, she believes that visiting that the visiting dead wear a common garb, or at least that's what she has learned. Is uh, that is that true according to your experience? I have not gotten uh, stories that seem to always indicate that. I mean, certainly you hear of white coming up and. Uh, You know, people don't often seem to be formally dressed, but I haven't really come across something that's been so consistent to really report on yet. And, you know, I I haven't been at my deathbed, so I couldn't really tell you that piece yet. Okay, so we don't know if they come in white or they come in pink or there is, you know, any common robe or et cetera. That's what we're saying, right? Right. Not that I have seen or heard from people. (laughs) All right, let's go to line three and talk to uh, Anika out of Hollywood, Florida. Welcome to Provocative Enlightenment. Hello, dear. I thank you so kindly for uh, taking my call. Of I course. was do- and I, I heard the the young gentleman talk about hospice, and I just um, have every time I go past a hospice, I stop in. I re- you know I, I'm I'm going to really be um, uh, proactive and and moving towards that field, although I'm in another field. But I always get this energy, and I always feel that I want to be around people so they don't um so they don't um die alone. And I just have another take on death. I just think it's energy change in form. I believe that um we've never left heaven. You know, I, I just have that belief that we've never left heaven. This is such a dream and and when we leave this realm that's reality. You know, but anyway, I just wanted to make that comment and oh. thank you so much for doing your work. I sat with my son while he passed and uh, trying to figure out, you know, um, he was just 29 years old and he went through some transitions and things like that. But, um, you know, it he just sat, as I, as I sat with him, I just felt his energy saying, my, this is a good thing and, and, and I'm ready. You know, I'm so ready, and, and I felt real good about it. You That's know. wonderful. Well, I'll tell you one thing along those lines, and you mentioned it in the caller before you mentioned it also, that uh, I did a book years ago with Elizabeth Kubler-Ross called Life Lessons, and, mm-hmm. and there was a, a subtext in the book sort of, what if we died tomorrow? How would our today be different? And, Why? That's, and that's, that's very motivating in terms of making your life one worth living. It's Absolutely. interesting, now doing this book, I, I also add to that, and what if life never ends? We just continue mm-hmm. on, because for me, knowing that loved ones are there and who greet us, it, it, it's, you know, such a great, um, uh, I, I don't know, internal, profound feeling to me that uh, who we are continues on. Just like you said, we are just energy. And this yes, is a yes, suit of clothes energy. we're wearing this lifetime. And uh, Deepak um, Chapkor, I uh, read in one of his books, and somebody was asking him about, um, you know, what did he, how did he view death? And he um, said something about a house and the space within the house. And if the house falls down, the house is gone, but the space is still there. Actually, the space and energy doesn't go anywhere. It's always around. You know, so we just tra- it's like we just transform out of that this body, which is made up of, you know, earth stuff, 
and move into another realm. And, and I just love that. Um, and I love the work that you're doing, too. Thank you so much. And the thing that I love, too, that someone said is when we die, it's going to be like taking a tight shoe off. Yeah. Can you, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think so, too. And when you when you realize that it's a transition of life because um, the death rate is 100%, none of us are going to get out of here alive. So we might as well enjoy it, you know, and and walk towards it when it's ready. Because in our time, we all have, we all we all going, you know. So we might as well enjoy this life and the, the fear that I think that uh, I'm not knocking any religion. I just want to know, let you know that. But I, the fear that we have as a society of something that's so natural has sure. really played a you know a role in and and uh people being um psychologically dysfunctional and a whole lot of other things you know and people still can't get over pe- you know they stay losing people as if people are lost you know and people i mean energy doesn't go anywhere you know so anyway thank you so very much you thanks for welcome. calling thank Anika. You. i came for fine Going back to the chat room, and, and this is one that, that uh, interests me a great deal. A question out of the chat room says, how about our pets? Do they join us? You know, I have heard conflicting information on that, that people have told me that their parents, that their pets have come and that their pets haven't come. Now, I don't know sometimes if when people say, you know, they don't see their pet, whether their pets will be there or not. So uh, I, I actually don't have an answer to that. Mm. I don't see why they wouldn't. Um, you know, I believe that any one or any animal or any life that's capable of love is capable of joining us again. So we will see. I hope so. I have pets. I want to see them again. <laughs> yeah, so do I. A couple of dear friends in that, that category. Before I jump back now to the phone calls, I, you know, I've got a couple of things that are just we haven't lined out. There were th- there are three basic commonalities that you draw out in visions, trips, and crowded rooms, and the title says it. You know, we talked a little bit about the visions. We talked about the crowded room. Nobody dies alone. All these people there. Some you know, some you don't. Uh, but we haven't talked uh, talked at all about this notion of preparing for a trip. Tell us about that common denominator. Sure. The dying, interestingly enough, will often. Uh, talk about that sense that they have to get ready. They they have to get prepared. Um, they, they they need to get their tickets or their passport or something like that. Or they just have a sense that they can't seem to articulate to people about they have to prepare and get ready for a journey. And it's interesting when we try to kind of pin people down and say, where would you go? What do you need? Uh, you know, you don't get very far, but there does seem to be uh, this notion of a journey that's about to happen. No one seems to be on their deathbed. There just doesn't come across reports of people who are going, I'm about to enter the nothingness, or I'm about to go nowhere, or I'm about to end. There always seems to be more, and more often entails a journey or a trip of some kind. Interesting, interesting. Now, I've got one more heavy one here, David. Uh, And we always hit a guest with a heavy one. Okay. Uh, You can call it a controversial if you want. But, you know, how about the ethical side of things? I mean, in in your book, your introduction sets the book up well, but it leaves uh, an unanswered question. What do you think the ethical ramifications are for continued support via artificial nutrients or other means for the so-called terminally ill or brain-dead patients or, you know, let me add this caveat. What about the persistent, so-called persistent vegetative states? Uh, you know, take someone like Terry Schiavo, where we have subsequently learned that patients in this kind of condition are not always terminal. Indeed, uh, some recent science has discovered, you know, methods and treatments, uh, uh, ways of, uh, of discovering uh, their their level of consciousness, if you will. What What is your ethical take on that? Do we define this? I mean, I guess I look at it this way from a definition standpoint, and I'll come right to the point here. The persistent vegetative state can be conceived of as 
either the lowest functioning phase of life or as the highest functioning phase of death. And the way you treat it will depend upon the, you know, the definition that's given to it. How do you see this whole issue? Well, it's a very complex issue, and, you know, that is what I live and deal with every day in our hospitals that I work in. I work in a three-hospital system in Los Angeles County with a, a independent hospice also attached to it. So, you know, we deal with ethical issues all the time, and I think the way you deal with it is to be willing to look at all sides, to discuss it, to see what the wishes of the patients were, what the needs are, to honor life, to make sure um, – all the stakeholders have been heard, and especially what what the patient's belief system is and who they are as a person. So, you know, I don't think there is a one answer fits all of this. I think that there's also a clear message to all of us to share our beliefs and our wishes with our family members and with our friends and relatives, because they are the ones that sometimes will speak for us. And, you know, from the hospital side, we want to make sure we're hearing from someone about what a person's wishes are. So the more we can do that, the better. All right. Okay. <clears throat> we could spend an hour on just the ethical side of that one, but I'm going to let it go because we've got a lot of callers and still more questions out of the chat rooms. Let's go to line go one and, and and talk to Crystal out of Kalamazoo, Michigan. Crystal, welcome to Provocative Enlightenment. Thank you so much, Eldon, and, and thank you, David. I really appreciate all the work that both of you do. Um, I, I have a sort of a, a question, an odd question. Um, we often talk about end of life and um, sort of positive experiences that come with that. Do you have any information or has anybody ever reported anything about going to hell or, you know, anything about hell? Great question. Great question. I was so curious as when we began these interviews of people, because we all hear the stories, but when, you know, we were beginning interviews all over, I was so curious to see how that was going to play out and, and what kind of stories we would get. Interestingly enough, it seems like people see um, loved ones greeting them that they are comforted by, and you may get someone that you don't know, but no one came along that was someone that the person fears, and nothing about, you know, the devil or hell or any of those things came along either. And I, quite frankly, was surprised because I really expected that. There were stories of patients who were expecting hell or expecting to see a husband greeting them who had abused them and they didn't want to see him. But surprisingly, that did not happen. So you've it, never had one single person? We have had plenty of people who have come forth and said that their mother died being so afraid she was going to see her husband who abused her again, and maybe she died in fear, afraid she would see him, but no one said they saw them. Okay. Which was shocking to me, and I didn't expect that. Well, maybe that's good news. It is good. Well, you know, that's what I thought. We don't see our enemies when we die, which is good. Yeah. Uh, and you're also not in a prison hospital or in a mm. concentration camp or somewhere where you might, you know, I, I hope you're right. I hope there is no hell. Let's I leave do it too. at that. I do Thanks too. for calling, Thank Crystal. Thank you so much. Uh, indeed. All right. Listen, David, uh, we, we've got about, uh, I can give you about 45 seconds. That's what it comes down to. I want I want our audience to know how to contact you. Uh, give your website again. Absolutely. Uh, tell them where to get your book. It's grief.com. And if you have a story you want to share with me, I'm at david at grief.com. You can find me on Facebook or Twitter or just go to grief.com, and you can link up with me everywhere there. I'd love to hear from you. And the book is Visions, Trips, in Crowded Rooms. That's a book we've been talking about today. Actually, has several books. And, David, they can get this book uh just about anywhere, can't they? Absolutely. Any bookstore, Borders, uh, Barnes & Noble, Amazon, anywhere you'd like. Hopefully it's there as well as the other books with Kubler-Ross that I've written too. All right. Well, we certainly appreciate you joining us today. You uh, are an excellent guest, and, per, you know, we're going to have to have you back. Oh, and, thank you uh, for doing this. You're really wonderful, and I'm, I really love being with you, so thank you. Oh, thank you. <laughs> All right. Well, we've come to the end of another hour of Provocative Enlightenment Radio. I want to thank you all for joining us, and I hope you enjoyed our show, and I hope you'll join us again next week, same time, same place. 
If you have comments on our show, you know, do let us know. Uh, as I said at the top, and as I say at the top of every show, I do read all of your letters. They do impact our programming. Now, you sometimes tell us who our guests, our next guests are going to be. So don't be bashful. Get that letter in to us. All right. Until next time, then, wherever you are in the world, remember, and I, I, I can't emphasize this too much, remember, believing in yourself always absolutely matters. <laughs>